Hey everyone, welcome back to Linux Weekly, daily Wednesdays when we sit back, we relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of Linux and open source. I'm Vince Doe, and that is Joe Ryan, and everyone watching us live hello, on hello. Twitch, eventually watching me play around, fiddle with switches, going, why is yeah. it so loud? There's a problem between me and Reaper and my headphones and the fiber optics running over then. I'll talk mm. about that in a minute when we get to the DAW segment, because there is a new version of Reaper, but Jill, a special mm. thing happened. What a special happened? thing that would have made me very excited if it was, I don't know, like 1997. I would have, I would have squeed a little yes. bit. Yes. I would have squeed. <laughs> if it would have been around like 1999, this is something I posted earlier. I said, I would have been happy, but also worried because there may or may not have been a um, web server running at uni that mm. uni might not have known about. But okay. it was the early days of the internet, <laughs> but we weren't worried about it. It was just a test thing. What I'm talking about. Slash dot. Um, you know, I wrote that little um, article about, hey, this is a hack Sony camera. It's really cool and they're inexpensive and all that. So, yeah, Let It Gamecast ended up on Slash dot. So, yay. I'm very excited. That has happened. Yes, I know Slash dot's not necessarily at all what it used to be. But. The reason I bring this up, there's a video, and there's they link to the video, Jill, of um, mm -hmm. our show. Yeah, they Which, sure that do. That was the wrong link. <laughs> Can I find it? Uh oh. And... <laughs> Spoilers. Okay, on the podcast. There it goes. There we go. <laughs> there we are. Look at that. That's amazing. It's terrifying. It's petrifying. But also, uh, this all started uh, the day before when Frank was featured on Hackaday which uh, I thought it was kind of fun. I was browsing through Hackaday, and I'm like, I know that skeleton. Yes, absolutely. And, yeah, sure enough, Hackaday did a little article and uh, covered all the stuff that I did with the Sony A5000. So, yeah, there you go. Somewhat internet famous. Look at it. But, yeah, if, uh, I, I've already covered. It wasn't ever slash dot that I was worried about or excited about growing up. Even when I first started this, my goal was never to be on Slashdot or anything like that. We've been on Hackaday yeah. before, which is awesome. Yes. Thanks, Hackaday. And yeah. thanks, Slashdot. And um, it was to get on LinuxGames.com. <laughs> you might not even know about LinuxGames.com. Mm -hmm. That was like the mm -hmm. news source in the late 90s, 2000s. And, like, and I remember the first time something from Linux Gamecast made it on that. I'm like, yep, mission accomplished. I'm good. Yay. But that also <laughs> boils down to like, I don't want a lot of attention on things I do too, because that takes some of the fun out of it. Yesterday though, yesterday, have you ever had this happen? Maybe you have at home. Maybe you have it yourself, Jill. Okay. One little thing happens and you start off like, okay, well, maybe I'll take care of this one little thing, but then it just cascades into this big, super big project. And that's what happened yesterday. This. It's the fault of a single resistor, uh. <laughs> a single little resistor, a 60 ohm quarter watt resistor that I needed to put on the back of the little blue box mm. in the studio that takes care of the de-assing because it's old and it's radio stuff. And they expect you to like, yes, you need to be able to ground that, which I do. And I couldn't find it. I pulled it off to test some of the pigtail cables because I was tracking down another issue and I was like, where'd my resistor go? And you just got to screw it onto the back, you know, between like haphazardly, there's not like insert resistor here thing. Little resistor, big rack of stuff back here. So I'm hundreds, like literal hundreds of cables <laughs> looking for this little tiny resistor, trying to pick up, I got like flashlight and I'm looking because, you know, something small <laughs> like that is going to yeah, hide like behind a wheel hide. or something you're not going to find it. you're going to find it like six years later and you're like really that's where it was this whole time yeah huh i was determined to find this because i knew i did not have that value of resistor in the house i'm like of course not and i didn't want to make a franken resistor plus i didn't have enough aid for the right value to even get one that low i got tired of digging i was de so determined that i just pulled everything out of the rack, reorganized all the cables, cleaned everything, got all those dust bunnies, you know, those yeah. things that get behind electronics, like behind your PCs, and you're like, oh, <laughs> oh, and you can't get too upset at it because that's made 100% out of you. I'm like, that's me stuff. No. <laughs> and um, dead skin, baby. That's how it works. <laughs> and um, 
I get all that cleaned up, clean the wood floors and all. What I'm getting to is it looks like this now, I'm buying Jackbox, running and everything. That is the, I don't have a before picture to really hit you, but that is the, it's never been that simplified and organized. All the cables are running up under the table and running to the back over to the rack. And of course you can't see what's below that because all those are uh, umbilical cables running between the other five PCs in the studio. But I'm very pleased with that. And if you've ever been curious about what the back of the Dawn the Studio, when I say Jackbox, that's the business into Jackbox. That's everything in it. Sound cards, the BNC word clock cables, the audio breakout for the XLR, the fiber optics, and everything else in a big glowing mysterious thing that's just galvanic um, isolation for USB for the control surfaces. Mm. And there you go. Yeah, that was it. But yeah, that that that's all respond. And by the way, I have not found that resistor, Joe. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> After uh, all that, I didn't even get my little victory lap at the end. Oh no! To go, ha! I found it, which also made me. Like, I keep thinking about this. I don't. I've not put pen to paper to see if it's financially viable yet. But I want. Really wanted to start Dollar Resistor Club. Because what happened last night, Dill, is I just needed that one resistor. I was like, give me a metal film resistor. It needs to be 60 ohms. Like, can I just get a resistor? Go to DigiKey, go to Mauser, and it's like, don't you mean like 300? That'd make more sense, right? And I'm like, no, just one. Yeah. Like, no, it'd be really cool if you ordered like 500. No, that'd be better. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I just need one. Like, uh, yeah, I, I'm willing to pay a dollar for a resistor, which is a ludicrous price to pay for a single resistor. We're like, just can I just get one? And yeah. then you run into like the real scam things, you know, and then people have like four resistors for three bucks or something like that of like questionable make and model. And like there needs to be a service online where I can give somebody a dollar and they send me a resistor. Because we don't have um like locally, no place locally I can go to pick up a resistor. We used to have the radio shacks back when. But even then you had to go to the right radio shack and like know which one that was and like fish in the back and maybe you could find the right value and of course you would overpay so yeah i got i ended up buying like another briefcase of resistors to get one resistor there's the moral of that story that'll be in <laughs> later this week and uh yeah Aww. how about you anything exciting <laughs> Yeah. Well, besides uh, seeing our our feed featured on uh, in uh, Google AI on on my Google uh, main page on uh, on my phone, that was really sweet. <laughs> the the um, slash dot article was featured with the Google AI. So that well, was like awesome. Google News. Yeah, we made it to Google News. So that was, <laughs> that was really cool. And the other thing I got is a new cute penguin plushie that is very blue and capsule shaped. It's so cute. <laughs> so that's not a penguin. That's a diseased loaf of bread. <laughs> loaf of bread. That's so funny that you say that. <laughs> is this accurate? Yeah, it is accurate. Uh, my husband said it looks very larval. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so... I mean, if, if you're going to listen to somebody about larval states of insects, he's yeah, the guy you so go to. Cute. So. He's so cute. <laughs> My larval penguin. <laughs> I just loved it. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's roughly the size of a horse tranquilizer, so, you know. Yeah, it's pretty big. <laughs> penguin loaf. <laughs> penguin loaf. I love it. Oh, man. Where are you going to put it? Um, yeah, you, you'll see it over here somewhere in my collection. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> so hopefully your new penguin is uh, not running OG x86-64. Yeah, correct. <laughs> so, yeah, there is a micro architectural level change actually coming to OpenSUSE's rolling release Open Suse Tumbleweed. And they are actually dropping support for x86 64 version 1 CPUs and is transitioning to supporting x86 64 version 2 CPUs and newer. 
So the x86-64 version 1 CPUs actually consist of AMD Athlon, Core 2, Phenom 2s, 64-bit Pentium 4s, yes, those existed, and AMD Opterons. <laughs> so, and in fact, uh, uh, if you don't, if for those of you that don't know, the Opteron was actually the first AMD 64 based processor and was released in April of 2003. <laughs> and I do have one in my collection. <laughs> so that's cool. But the good thing is, is that, that the OpenSUSE devs are setting up a new repository named OpenSUSE factory legacy x86 and they're asking for volunteers to maintain aspects of the repository designed for the x86 64 version one machines and you know actually this is really sad news for us open tumbleweed fans using it on older hardware including mere ppc in our discord chat who let us know about this change so thank you, Mir, for the story, because this is <laughs> very, very important to know. And me personally, I have an older Core 2 Duo and an Athlon that I run Tumbleweed on. And, uh, you know, OpenSUSE, as you know, Ven, has always been a great distro also for supporting older hardware and another option to Debian on older machines. So it's really sad seeing that support go go away, but... I understand, too. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I mean, you know, if your CPU is old enough to be graduating UD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is true. <laughs> um, I understand. I understand. I, I understand the feels. Uh, yeah. But I also understand where OpenSUSE is coming from. They, they got to do stuff like this. I mean, you know, Pity of Four, Athlon, Core 2, Duos, Phenom 2. Yeah. <laughs> People are going to be upset, but I mean, you're not doing anything terribly useful with those CPUs outside of like, I really enjoy wasting electricity because they're horribly inefficient compared to anything remotely modern. But hey, you know, some people yeah. are like, die, environment, die. <laughs> uh, now, the original plan for this was you know there's a couple of versions of the x86 64 v1 is the you know first it is the oldest and you need some archaic hardware to go grrr <laughs> they wanted to mix everything up to v3 yeah yeah i'm glad they didn't do that <laughs> that would have been too big a change all the way up to v3 then you know then you get close enough within like decades old technology where you're like yeah all right <laughs> all right that could be a problem and they said yeah you know what that could be a problem so we're going to compromise there. Susie's next gen enterprise distro is going to nix everything. You're going to need uh, everything up to V2. Yeah. So you need V3 and up, which again, this makes sense. I mean, if you want, I always say this and it winds somebody up. If you want to have your retro PC run a period, correct dis Linux distribution on it mm -hmm. from that time, you know? Yeah. That's what I do with all my old machines. Even my 386s, 486s, just have the old distros on them. And no, Jill, I away. need to run the latest Arch on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a thing. And I'm kidding. I'm having fun. You do like whatever you want. If you get some old PCs and you want to try to, I mean, for all I know, for all I know, different strokes for different folks, right? Yeah. You, you just like the challenge of trying to cram something like that. I, I, I personally, Think is a little more entertaining watching uh i've watched a couple of tech tubers try to install something like red hat 6 and just watching the frustration oh yeah <laughs> and I, I was watching it for all the wrong reasons and like, now i want you to imagine doing everything you're doing right now and having so much trouble with without google or internet let's just take the internet completely out of it now go for it here's a big thick book from red hat <laughs> some of the stuff you need in there not all of it <laughs> yeah Oh boy, I still have my original Red Hat in, uh, books that you bought in the store when you when you bought the distro. <laughs> well, I mean, that's how you that's how you got yeah. Linux. Like by the that's time we were at like it. Red Hat Five, yeah. Red Hat Six, like you weren't downloading CDs worth of information over your dial up. I mean, this yeah. is a different time. It was a different mindset. Like you went to the store and you got the CDs. You know, the C the software Red Hat, Linux was free. You paid yeah. for the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that, that was a. Uh, it was a different time, but hey, if vintage computing, if that's going to throw a wrench, you know what? It's time to upgrade that core two duo. Buy a Raspberry Pi <laughs> three. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Raspberry Pi 3. <laughs> and run some laps around it. <laughs> and spend more money on your Raspberry Pi 3. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you don't want to run a Raspberry Pi 4. That'd be too modern. You can <laughs> yeah. be like, no, no, this is my vintage Raspberry Pi 3. Yes, yeah. it's retro. <clears throat> and that'll run everything you need. So, good news, everybody. Um, the DAW I use in the studio, the studio over here, this little bit of this is for you. That's a digital audio workstation. Use it for live mixing. We're using it for the show right now. It takes care of uh, like our little fiber optic network I have set up for the NetJack and stuff like that. It's got a new version out, version 671, and it has contracted, unfortunately, a venereal disease. That is right. Uh, Reaper now has the clap. This is true. It has contracted the clap. And what's clap? We've mm -hmm. talked about it on this show. I have anyway. Yeah. Clap, that's the latest plugin format. You know, it's following in the footsteps of VST, LV2. And unlike VST, it's not controlled by just one company. And it's open source. So everybody can make use of it. You know, we don't have to like deal with Steinberg constantly. And unlike LV2, it's properly documented and it's not quite as monolithic and it's got a governing body and people seem interested in wanting to use it like Bitvig. Bitvig supports uh, Clap. Now Reaper does. Now this is still early days. We're gonna, still going to need some frameworks. I'm looking at users um, to support it officially, which would be nice. But a couple of things, the latest version of Reaper improves your keyboard handling for your plugins on legs. I've not noticed a problem with that. But if you haven't given Reaper a look and you've been looking for a digital audio workstation, now's a great time to do it. You know, it's what I use to mix the shows. And I've been there. I've used them all. It's a personal preference, though. It is. At the end of the day, if you ask me, a digital audio workstation, a DAW's a DAW. Doesn't matter which one it is. They all do roughly the same thing. Some are slightly better or tuned or attuned to do you know, like EDM production. There's a new DAW called Stargate. And that's really like the focus for stuff like that. But when you start looking at, you know, industry standard, what's that? That's Pro Tools or Ableton. And you're going to be dealing with that. Reaper's making interesting headroom into that with the younger generation because they don't want to deal with Pro, Tool, Pro Tools licensing. That's strangely difficult to say. And uh, yeah, Ableton is just uh, antique. So, you know, there's Audor, there's Harrison Mixbus. Reaper's a little better, though. I think software wise, it's better. And, but most importantly, the knowledge base. So many people use Reaper and, you know, Reaper's coming on, on like being a 20 year old project, roughly the same amount of time as Adore. If there's a question that you can come up with to ask about Reaper, it has been discussed in multiple threads to death. And that knowledge base is what makes it so powerful. Mm. When I'm like, hmm, I have an idea. Maybe I can do this and do this and do this. You're not led to like one forum somewhere where one person asked the question back in 2013 and no one ever got back to the answer. And that is, seems like a very particular thing that I might've run into or um, <laughs> I'm not even going to get into it. Knowledge base for software is important. And yes, it's not open source. So you need yeah. to keep that in mind because you only use open source software, the person who's about to type the comment on the YouTube video, and you only play open source video games as well, because there's the same thing. You're not a hypocrite, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Aww. They, they do have a nice uh, trial that you can download and, and play with. That's, that's what's up with how I've uh, used Reaper. It's completely free to you. Yeah. Honestly, it, does, it continues working after 60 days. Oh, it does? Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> it's, it is It is the one zip thing. Okay. Of like, it's the nag screen, and that's their business model. Like, you're going to get enough value out of this? Or like, yeah, I need to give them some money mm -hmm. to do that, which is, um, but yeah, use whatever you work works for you as long as it's not whatever they're doing to Audacity right now, because it seems like they're determined to turn Audacity into a really, really bad DAW mm -hmm. instead of a very very nice purpose-built audio editor yeah oh um i wish everybody the best yeah so there's that now ashley linux m2 we all wanted m2 to play with speaking of like vintage hardware there you go there's something to pick up at 10 years from now like hopefully yeah. like at you know, like oh yeah let me get one of those to go play with, put some linux on it but it'll be done by then you know it won't be any fun yeah 
<laughs> so yeah, there's actually a lot of exciting new features and more hardware support this month for Asahi Linux, the distro bringing Linux to App Apple Silicon Max. And yes, Vin, someday they will be vintage as well. <laughs> so <laughs> there is now new USB 3.0 device support. And that is really, really wonderful. They've been, the dev devs have been working really hard on, in this project to get all the hardware working on the Max, the Silicon Max. And there is now a keyboard backlight support and the display brightness and resolution sw switching and sleep mode now are working out of the box. And one of my favorite things and one of the most exciting new developments that Asahi Linux developer Asahi Lena, who streams on YouTube, she quoted on Twitter, KDE runs on the Apple M2 with full GPU acceleration, running the game Xenotic, GL Mark II, and EGL gears at the same time. And my Linux kernel driver now supports the M2, and it works out of the box with Alyssa's Mesa driver. No user space changes needed. Woohoo! This is big news. It wasn't that long ago <laughs> that you remember just just trying to get graphics, the graphics stack to work on the. Uh, oh, Jill, so I'm <laughs> dying to run out and spend a couple of grand on a new, shiny new PC and kind of run Xenonic on it a little bit. Yeah. Maybe. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the nice thing is you can pick up one of the iMacs or the uh, uh, some of the other devices for under a thousand dollars now. So that's that's good news. <laughs> so. but I don't want the M1 stuff. That stuff's so old. It's antiquated. I need oh, the, I need the two need the... after it. That's how I know it's better. Well, you'll have to wait another year, and then you can get those from an, under a thousand. <laughs> when the M3 comes out, but then I will yeah. want the M2, Joe. I'll need the M3 for the. Oh, I this do. is true. <laughs> well, I guess you'll just have to put out the money. <laughs> <laughs> so another cool thing is that Asahi uh, Lena also tweeted out that she got actually eight hours of battery life gaming on Asahi Linux on a MacBook Air. Woohoo! And let me uh, just go out on a very, very short, stable awesome. limb and say. Should we be bragging about eight hours of battery life in 2022? I think not, <laughs> yeah, because if yeah. you had asked me 10 years ago, I'm like, hey, what are we going to get on our mobile laptops? I'm like, I don't know, week, two weeks, something like that. No, here know. we are in 2022, where it's still appropriate to do a victory lap. Come yeah. On, it's eight hours, and it's not even the M, M series, like any laptop. If you get eight hours out of it, you're like, man, that's pretty good, right? Yeah, well, actually, you're, it's so true, Vin. My latest uh, Samsung phone, I get two days out of it on the battery, so... <laughs> the whole laptops, you know, require quite a bit more uh, juice to run, so <laughs> that, that's their limitation. But that's that's pretty good that you can get eight hours on a MacBook Air because that's what Mac OS X gets on the MacBook Air. So at least we have equivalent times now under Linux and Asahi Linux. Well, my Pine Book stays powered for a week, Joe. What are you, what are you talking yeah. about? It sounds like you guys are just running an efficient laptop. <laughs> very true. <laughs> very true. I have a Pine Book, and it is very efficient. It's it's not quite as powerful as the MacBook Air, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> it could run Zontic. Zonotic. Zonotic. It can. It can. <laughs> and it is a wonderful machine. And the pros, the... The Pinebook Pros are, are wonderful. <laughs> My old point is battery technology has not kept pace with our computing needs. Uh, correct. You're absolutely right, Ben. <laughs> I remember we were talking about, um, not on this show, but years and years ago, maybe like two decades ago, there was a small but noticeable push into fuel cell technology for portables. Mm. Then everyone went, people are going to try to fly with those. Oh yeah, you, yeah. yeah you, don't, you don't want like no. compressed little gas things on. Uh, yeah, they're not going to try with that TSS <laughs> taken away from you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's a ton in this that is just really good. This is a fascinating project to keep track of, and you know, USB support. Even they're like, it might be a little. It's pretty solid. They said you might run mm -hmm. into some glitches with the USB 3.0 if you like are um, speed plugging. Like if you're in a competition to see how many times you can push it in and out. They said you might run into some glitches, but outside of that, nothing. Nothing really to worry about. No, these are not mute systems. You know, you don't have speaker support. 
Yeah, but not yet. You want to play your have... shooty pew pews, you're going to have support for headphones. And that's Yay. right, because Pavic has reverse engineered uh, the completely undocumented, thanks Apple, the CS42L84 headphone codec. So the headphone jack support, it's there and it's across the board too. So you don't have to worry about that. But what caught my attention is they're also contributing back. They're shipping the also UCM comp. Ashi. <laughs> Asashi. Let's call these things like James. I mean, come on. Uh, package. And that's going to integrate into your Pulse Audio pipe wires and stuff like that and give you volume controls and, you know, the hot plugging seamless support, which is really neat too. Awesome. Yeah, it's just amazing what they're doing with that project in so short of time. <laughs> it's still an alpha, but look what uh, we've already got. You know, as soon as they get everything wor working, they'll put out the the betas and the final releases, and then we'll be good to go with the Silicon Max. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then you got to get over the problem of like buying a Mac. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the expense. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. I was talking about the social stigma. Oh, okay. Do you want to find yourself, Ven, computing at Starbucks? <laughs> That's uh, it's like you spent a thousand dollars on a laptop. Yeah, hmm? I've I've spent quite a bit more than that on a laptop before. I would look just the same. I was like, yeah, thousand dollars laptop. All right, you know, but you know, each to their own. Um, I think laptops are silly devices. Period. In these modern days, I, I, I've li I live that tablet lifestyle. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> but if you like to carry your tablet around with a keyboard hard attached to it, you do mm -hmm. you. <laughs> um, you know what? That's here's like one of the interesting like convergent things. You know, with the M series uh, CPUs, that Apple has hands down done an incredible job with the ARM platform. Is the uh, being able to bring that over to the iPad? The iPad Pro. So mm. it's within the realm of possibility to start seeing these things, uh, you know, that leveraging that much compute and something that is hyper portable that doesn't have a keyboard permanently attached to it, you know? Yeah. Things get a little more interesting. But then again, I Absolutely. think like a lot of you at home, I want to see what can you do, Apple? What can you do when you have to water cool one of these things? Cut one of these things up to 14 and make, make it <laughs> smoke a little bit. Let's, let's, Let's see what it is. Let's see how dirty it can get. Come on. Interesting times indeed. Interesting times indeed. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're about to talk about the Raspberry Pi. But before we do that, a little bit of shameless self-promotion. If you like what we do, head over to patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast. Kick us a few quarters to our face. You get access mm -hmm. to our Discord where we hang out the other six days of the week, you get the live and uncut version of this. You're watching live. You're like, that's great. Maybe you missed it. You want to catch it immediately after. Maybe you want it in podcast format, custom RSS feed, courtesy of patron. And for your support, it's one of our ways to thank us. And check this out. I put stuff up early. I got ideas when I'm prototyping. They, they go up, you know, early access. I don't like putting stuff behind a paywall, but I, a sneak peek for the people that support us. What else do we have? Early access to game streams and stuff like that. If you want to hop on and come play with the Jordan tomorrow night, he's doing the Jorderlands. Yay. Access to our Trackmania <laughs> server, which mm -hmm. Jill and myself are going to be back on Friday. Yay! I'm doing the things. <laughs> I'm going to be fun watching people practice there and uh, just a bunch of other stuff. Go check it out. We also have Amazon wish list. If you want to pick up Jill a another <laughs> ham-shaped penguin you can do it. <laughs> I could always use more pink penguin and rainbow penguins in my plushy penguins in my collection. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Man. All and of mugs. that. It's on Linux Game Cast. Hover over the support <laughs> button. Anything you can kick at our face. I got one for the studio. I got a bunch of hipster green electronics. Oh right, that here's the official name for the um, Trek Mania. But it's the Rectangle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. That's the one for the studio, a bunch of okay. interesting things. Yeah, the Steam yeah. Rectangle. That's the uh, box that I'm going to be building, hopefully be able to stream the construction process for, which is going nice. to replace the box that you're on right now. But it's going to be like this crazy, crazy multi-purpose box that does a bunch of different things. And um, I'm making it in lieu of Steam, not releasing the Steam Cube, which I've talked yeah, about. This is my imaginary product where you just give me the innards of a Steam Deck and a Cube. <laughs> I don't need the controllers of the screen, you know, like two, 300 bucks, something like that. And I'm like, fine, I'll make my own Steam Cube, but they don't make cube little cases like 
So, no, well, I'm sure they then. do. I'm sure <laughs> they do, but I got Vin Enns. All right, let's face this. This is going to be hilarious watching me trying to put together a micro ATX system. So I'm going to be building a business size uh, box to replace this one. And it's going to be called the Steam Rack Tingle. But it's going to be more of a wreck because I've never built a micro ATX system. Oh, yeah, that's right. I remember you saying that. You've always had yeah. full size ATX. So. EATX is probably. Uh, yeah. 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 I've, I've built with all form factors, including mini ITX and smaller. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's not like a precision or anything like that. You know, I do plenty of surface mount solder work and stuff like that under yeah. magnifying glass. It's just. When it comes down to getting my meat mitts into things like that without the accessories to make them smaller, like tweezers. Yes. Um, yeah. So that make it easier. Yeah. It might be fun. It might be mm -hmm. entertaining. Uh, I look forward to sticking it. And plus, that's going to be like a completely separate system build. So we'll be able to do a little live stream of uh, sticking that thing together and putting different versions of uh, Linux on it. I know, cool. I'm just kidding. It's going to be running Debian because that's what everything else runs in here. Mm hmm. Maybe put Pop! OS on it. Yeah, there you go. No. <laughs> Debian derivative. <laughs> uh, by way of Ubuntu. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it has several layers, It's yes. even like a more distant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm Debian. And I'm like, oh, you silly child. No, you're not. Um, cool. <laughs> cool times. We do thank you for your support. And all the, um, you know, just share the show. Come say hi to us. IRC is completely open. It's free. It's bridge to our live chat with our Discord so everybody can uh, chat with each other. Do anything else? I think that's it. Uh, we got merch store.linuxgamecast.com. If you want the Trank Media information, go to filthy.linuxgamecast.com. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. We don't have a frank.linuxgamecast.com because Frank's <laughs> no. ego is bad enough as it is. Uh, yes. It doesn't need <laughs> any encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's the frank is awesome this is an orange <laughs> cake pie ah, it almost looks like a pumpkin but now that you've zoomed in on it yes that is an a, a full-size orange on a little chocolate cake on top of a little chocolate cake <laughs> uh, that is a full-size cake with more cake shaped like an orange on top oh of it. okay it's, it's cake all the way cake. down jill I see. I see that now. <laughs> because we're going to be talking about the orange pie. This, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to week four. And it brings us to uh, take a trip with me all the way back to 2019, a time where you could buy a Raspberry Pi 4 8 gig for, you know, $75. <laughs> yeah. Well, what if I told you, you know, in 2019, you can get an octo core. Rock chip, mm -hmm. 2.4 gigahertz, and a 4, 8, 16, and 32 gigabyte flavors, gigabit LAN, TF card slot. Regular stuff like, the, did I mention this thing's got an NVMe plug on the oh, back? It does. Let me just sweet. go ahead and scroll down <laughs> and show you. It's got 8K. Yay, whatever. We don't have 8K TVs. Um, here's the back of it. Look at that. PCI Express 2.0, NVMe, 2242 NVMe, SSD, which is so cool. Headphone jack. All this fun stuff. And you're like, well, this is cool, Vin. You know, we've had, you know, since Raspberry Pi prices are like $200 now, you know, so we've been looking at things like $120, $150 boards. And like uh, Jordan, Jordan picked up the um, the Pi 6, whatever, you know, the one with like three, Ethernet three nodes. Cables. Yeah. yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Which that was a really cool piece of kit for like 160 bucks. We've been seeing some really great deals. But this, this is even more interesting because. You can get one right now. Well, this one's a little bit more. Hang on. Let me go to link two. What if I told you you get it for 68 bucks, Joe? Oh, that's, uh, this is really amazing. <laughs> and, um, you know, last week we had talked about the Radza Rock 5 SOC. And uh, that was also with a similar chipset, the RK3588 chipset which was a four core, but this orange Pi 5 uses the more updated RK3588S with the eight cores instead of four. So that, that's pretty sweet, and it's lower in price. But I'm a little <laughs> bit upset because earlier this week when these things first launched for pre-order, they yeah. were 75 bucks. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> they were $75. And what have they done? What, well, for eight, for the 8-gig version, that's now $83. Yeah. That's still. <laughs> but that's 83, so 82, 81, 80. So you get it for $80 with the imaginary coupon that you have to click a button in order to apply with $11 shipping. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Are yeah, you pretty me? sweet. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, and, and again, I'll continue on week four. I, I really hope uh, the Raspberry Pi Foundation like uh, doesn't, you know, I understand, but no, I don't understand why, why the Raspberry Pi Foundation is focusing on their business and enterprise customers. I think I go over this almost each and every week. Yeah. But that's neither here nor there. The concern is the knock-on effect of, you know, we're definitely deep into year three of generation of people and i'm not thinking about us we're old jill we're old I'm like whatever yeah. we're buying these things to play around with i'm thinking about you know teenage vin teenage jill you yeah. know 12 13 14 15 and you get people into univers going into university they're like hey i need a project board to work on this they can't get a raspberry pi and they're not spending 200 dollars. they're gonna buy something like this where previously they were buying raspberry pi one you know gen 2 gen 3 raspberry pis raspberry pi zeros and things like that not for the past three years. And you know what? It's that knock-on effect because these people are going to get jobs in IT. And later on, what we're seeing right now with, you know, where that industry mm -hmm. interest in Raspberry Pi, you rewind that 10 years, those kids were in uni. Now those kids are in, you know, middle management. They're at least in positions where they make purchasing decisions and uh, business decisions and what mm -hmm. hardware to use. And I understand you got to serve that market, but you got to think, you got to think down the road. And that's why, why I would genuinely worry, like, when I see stuff like this, but I mean, it's also good for our ecosystem, right? Yeah, That's good it, for it, our it absolutely is. But it, it's sad for the lineage of the Raspberry Pi, you know, and all those kids that. Well, I'm not like singing. Said, I'm not singing the death yeah. of Raspberry Pi by any stretch no, of the imagination. Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> but schools are having a hard time getting them, so they're going to these alternatives. But thank goodness we have alternatives. We got alternatives, and uh, yeah, that's uh, it's just like one of those weird things, though, isn't it? And like yeah. you always thought of, and you know, like right now, if somebody said, "Hey, what should I buy?" I'm like, well, "I can get a Raspberry Pi for eight gig for two hundred dollars." I'd laugh at them. I'm like, "No, um, you know, get something rock chip based because they've got a supply line channel readers. You know, these guys are running circles around them, and yeah, it's not like technology has stagnated over the last three years either. You know. <laughs> Then yeah. we have NVMe drives, then we have OctoCore, you know, big little <laughs> setups, and we have up to 32 gigs of memory. Like Amazing. 8 gig output. Um, and, you know, then again, like you can get all that for like 83 bucks now. Um, just, it's amazing. Yeah. Just, but yet prices of cell phones are still <laughs> skyrocketed. Because people are going to buy them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> It, it does seem like things like the banana pie, orange pie, and, you know, th they were always in the wings as alternatives. You know, there were the alternative things that people were playing around with, and they, they were fascinating. Like, hey, let's see what they're doing over here and what they're doing. Now it's just like the thing, mm -hmm. you know, people are going out and buying that. And I might pick up one of these. I got to, I'll just add this to the list of things I need to go out and buy eventually. And um, Same here. Yeah. Wish him the best. That's going to do it, Jill. We're running a little okay. bit long. 39 minutes. Got to bounce out of here. We got any famous words? Aw. Go out there and have some fun Linuxing on whatever device you choose. <laughs> you know what? If, if you see a giant orange on a cake, yeah. check before you bite into it. How about yeah. that? Maybe. <laughs> Aww. some credits. Oh, and thank you to our Theron, our advisor. He's always submitting uh, show note topics. He's, he's amazing. <laughs> we have so many uh, people to thank. We're talking about the same person? You said yeah. our Theron, right? Yeah. No, we're not talking. Clearly not talking about the same person. <laughs> our Theron. We've got our executive producers. We've got Empty in there. Uh, we have our Chicago level people. We have our sea monsters. And I can't read it right now unless I make my Twitch uh, screen a little bit bigger. <laughs> Aww. And thank you to everyone in chat. Thank you to Mir. Thank you to Joe. Thank you to JS Carhawk. We love you all. And everyone watching, all our viewers and all our patrons. 
Hey, beautiful <laughs> people. We'll catch you next week. I'll be back. Um, well, Jordan will be back tomorrow night if you want to watch that with Jordan Lens and uh, Friday, Trackmania, Saturday, yeah. Magic Steamcast Weekly. Bye-bye. Come join us. Mm-hmm. <laughs>